I'm sure you're looking at the title of this video and thinking to yourself, how can you do a rise and fall of the WNBA? When has the WNBA been anything other than a dump? <laughs> well, believe it or not, there was a time when the WNBA was almost relevant. There was a time when the WNBA was almost popular. Hell, if you compared the beginnings of the WNBA in the late 90s to the current WNBA that we see today, the WNBA was booming in the 90s. The origins of the WNBA traces back to late 1995. USA! The women's national basketball team at the time, they were preparing for the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. Now the team, they went on a 10 month tour traveling to 52 cities across America where they ended up going undefeated. The team was led by Cheryl Swoops, Lisa Leslie, and Dawn Staley. They eventually won the gold medal at the 96 Olympics. NBA commissioner David Stern, the ultimate capitalist, he saw an opportunity here. He recognized the popularity of the women's national team. Now at the time, the NBA itself was exploding in popularity. With the hundreds of millions of dollars that the NBA was making, perhaps David Stern thought that he could monetize women's basketball. <laughs> Such wishful thinking. If only David Stern knew at the time the financial black hole that he was creating. April 24th, 1996, the NBA Board of Governors, they approved the formation of the WNBA. Now, some believe that the WNBA was the first female professional basketball league here in the United States. The American Basketball League, they had a one-year head start on the future dump. After two years of operation, the ABL suddenly disappeared by filing bankruptcy. Now, unlike the WNBA, the ABL didn't have the benefit of being heavily subsidized by the NBA. If the WNBA wasn't subsidized by the NBA, they too would have been filing for bankruptcy two or three decades ago. The WNBA, they initially launched with eight teams, better known here on the channel as dumps. This initial launch of eight teams, it was a bit of overkill because Five of the eight teams, they eventually shut down. The Charlotte Sting, the Cleveland Rockers, the Houston Comets, the Utah Stars with two Zs. Well, KC, why did they have two Zs? And why in the hell did they spell stars S-T-A-R-Z-Z? -Z? I have no idea. Maybe they knew they would eventually be bankrupt and it wouldn't matter either way. Those four teams, though, along with the Sacramento Monarchs, they no longer exist today. The three original dumps that are still operational are the Phoenix Mercury, better known here on the channel as the Phoenix Masculines, the New York Liberty, and the LA Sparkles. The first game, it was played on June 21st, 1997. Some would say it was an exciting matchup between the New York Liberty and the LA Sparkles. Others would say it was painfully boring. The game was played at the LA Forum in Los Angeles and broadcast nationally on NBC. In an arena that holds over 17,000 people, the WNBA, they packed the LA Forum with 12,000 fans excited to watch women's basketball. Now, in most leagues, filling an arena to 69% capacity, that would be considered a huge embarrassing failure. But considering the fact that the current WNBA averages just over 6,000 fans a game, 12,000 for their first game, that was considered a monumental success. During their inaugural season, the WNBA, they averaged almost 2 million viewers a game for games broadcast on NBC. Are you starting to understand now how I could include the WNBA in our Rise and Fall series? Even though an average of just under 2 million on network television was considered god-awful in the late 90s, hell, 2 million, that would be considered god-awful in 2024 on broadcast television. But even though that number doesn't cut it for network television, it is significantly better than what the WNBA is averaging today. Attendance. Attendance was also decent during the inaugural season, with the WNBA averaging almost 10,000 fans a game. By their second season in 1998, two new dumps were added to the league the Detroit Shock, and the Washington Mystics. In keeping with WNBA tradition, the Detroit Shock, they would cease to exist a decade later, relocating to Tulsa, which eventually relocated to Dallas. As we're about to find out, this seems to be a common theme in the WNBA. Teams moving around the country hoping attendance will pick up in other cities, and it never happens. 
Now, if you follow the modern WNBA, well, let me rephrase that because very few people follow the modern WNBA. But if you happen to decide to follow the WNBA, you know it's a league that loves to celebrate first. For example, just last year, the only star in the league, Brittany Griner, known to friends and family as Bob Griner. Just last year, Bob Griner was hoping the WNBA would allow men choosing to identify as women to compete in the league of pretend basketball. Basically, Bob Griner was advocating for the first bearded beauty to compete in the WNBA. It's actually brilliant when you think about it. If women with beards are allowed to compete in the WNBA, they could secure a multi-million dollar sponsorship with just for men. Back in 2000, though, the WNBA, they celebrated the league's first First, the Houston Comets, which eventually joined the long list of dumps and extinction. The Comets, they won the first four WNBA titles. In order to celebrate their final championship win, they accepted an invitation to the White House. Now, historically, back in the 90s, only men's teams were invited to the White House to celebrate a championship. The Houston Comets, led by employee number one in the WNBA, the original pooper swooper, Cheryl Swoops, they were the first WNBA team to be invited to the White House. And no, they were not invited to empty the trash. They weren't invited to clean the bathrooms. They were actually invited to the White House to be honored. Unfortunately, this would be the final bright spot for the WNBA because as we entered the 21st century, the short-lived rise gave way to the inevitable fall, a fall that the WNBA has never recovered from. By 2003, WNBA players, they were threatening a labor strike. Why? <laughs> well, WNBA players were demanding that NBA Commissioner David Stern increase their salaries. Yeah. Yeah, the entitlement. It is nothing new in the WNBA. The same entitlement from 2003, it is alive and well in the WNBA today. Dump divers, they had the audacity to demand a raise in a league that was losing on average $10 million every season. As a result of this threat, the WNBA preseason was delayed, the WNBA draft was delayed, and David Stern, he threatened to cancel the entire regular season if WNBA players didn't get their head out of their own ass. Obviously, they acquiesced. Now, what's interesting about this it's the difference in mainstream media coverage of the WNBA in 2003 compared to 2024 and, and really the last three or four years. Back then, the mainstream media, they were not afraid to destroy the WNBA. Headline at the time at the Orlando Sentinel, WNBA has no leg to stand on in labor dispute. Headline at Deseret News, WNBA players just don't get it. <laughs> If WNBA players went on strike today, the mainstream media, they would accuse the NBA of misogyny. They would accuse the NBA of lacking gender equity for refusing to pay WNBA players the same salaries as NBA players. As is often the case with most labor strikes in professional sports, even a semi-professional sport like the WNBA, players threatening a strike. It was a black eye for the league. A decade earlier, a strike in Major League Baseball, which canceled an entire season, it damn near killed the league. Now, during the 90s, baseball was still a popular sport here in America. Even though you don't want to take the hit to your popularity, Major League Baseball, they had the foundation to absorb the hit. WNBA, they did not have the same luxury. By 2006, there were 14 teams in the WNBA. Remember when the league launched in 97 with eight teams and I told you guys that was five too many? Clearly, the WNBA didn't learn their lesson. By 2006, attendance had fallen from almost 10,000 a game in 97 to less than 7,500 a game. But that's okay. That's okay, because the WNBA accomplished another first in 2006. For the first time ever, the WNBA Finals, which is a five-game series, it reached an exciting fifth game. 
Although they didn't know it at the time, this would kind of be a mini peak for the WNBA. The 2006 regular season and playoffs, it represented the highest ratings the WNBA would see for the next 16 years. November of 2009, the WNBA, they announced that the Sacramento Monarchs would be the next dump to shut down permanently. Now, the WNBA, they claimed that the Monarchs were shutting down due to a lack of support from ownership. Of course, they never explained why ownership was refusing to support the team. Maybe, just maybe, it's because the good people of Sacramento didn't support the team. WNBA fans in Sacramento, they were kind of like dinosaurs. They were extinct. Their final season in 2009, the Monarchs averaged less than 8,000 a game in an arena that fits over 17,000. Now, the league, they announced that they were looking for new owners in the San Francisco Bay Area. But unfortunately for the WNBA, there was no interest. <laughs> 2011. National interest in the WNBA has declined to the point to where they're averaging just 270,000 viewers on ESPN2. Two years later, ratings get even worse, with ratings falling to 231,000, and the WNBA Finals averaging just 344,000. The 231,000 that the dump averaged during the 2013 season, that was incredibly damning because it came after what many consider to be the most highly publicized draft in league history. For the first time ever, ESPN, they broadcast the WNBA draft in prime time. Americans finally had the opportunity to see where their favorite college basketball players would be trading in their Nikes for steel-toed boots and collecting trash the next season. The first three picks of that WNBA draft, they were promoted as the three to see. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany Griner, better known here on the channel as Bob Griner, Skylar Diggins, and a future unknown player named Elena Del Doni. They were the first three players selected in the draft. Supposedly, these were the three to see. But as it turns out, no one wanted to see them. Four years later, this legendary three to see, they had tanked ratings in the WNBA to an all-time low. The 2017 season, the league averaged 171,000 viewers on national television. Now, at that point, most programming on television would be canceled. The WNBA had peaked in popularity in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, if you can even call that a peak in popularity. Nearly 20 years later, the league had consistently proven that they can't draw flies to a fresh turd. No one was watching the WNBA on television. From 2018 to 2022, the WNBA attendance, they set record lows three consecutive years. Now, I didn't count the 2021 season because it was impacted by the COVID. The WNBA, they were one of very, very few who actually benefited from the Kobe shutdowns. The shutdowns, they spared the WNBA from further embarrassment. Again, there was absolutely no reason to keep this league on national television. But according to the WNBA, there was a reason, there was an explanation for their consistent record of huge embarrassing failure. It wasn't their fault that basketball fans weren't enamored with airball dunks, missed layups, and a product that didn't even come remotely close to resembling basketball at a professional level. It wasn't their fault that the entire country had forgotten about their existence. No, 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 no! According to the Sue Bird, who is more known for being the wife of the insufferable Megan Rapino than anything that she has accomplished in the WNBA. According to the Sue Bird, it was the mainstream media's fault that the WNBA was a huge embarrassing failure. Two years ago, 2022, Sue Bird told USA Today that the WNBA, they don't receive enough mainstream media coverage. Now, of course, that could not be further from the truth. Since around the summer of 2020, the WNBA has seen a massive increase in mainstream media coverage. The problem is, this increase in media coverage, it further turned the average American against the WNBA. July of 2020, WNBA players stormed off the court during the playing of the national anthem. The face of the league, the legendary Bob Griner, Bob demanded that the WNBA quit playing the national anthem before pretend basketball games. Now, speaking of Bob Griner, 
She was arrested in February of 2022 for trying to sneak Grandpa's ganja into Russia for a planned vacation with Vlad Putin. The 2022 WNBA season, it was dedicated to the release of Bob Griner. Free PG! Free PG! She's being held hostage! To make matters worse, when Brittany Griner was released in December of 2022, our fearless leader, John Biden, he got absolutely swindled in negotiations for the release of Brittany Griner. In exchange for Brittany Griner, John Biden sent Victor Boot back to Russia, a known criminal and professional arms dealer. Basically, John Biden sent Russia a Rolls Royce in exchange for a Dodge Dart. Last year, the WNBA averaged 505,000 viewers, while the WNBA Finals were the most watched in 20 years. Now, a lot of people believe that the future is looking bright for the WNBA. Later this year, Caitlin Clark, she's going to submit her application to become a future dump diver. She will sacrifice her final year of professional basketball at the college level to begin her career as a trash engineer in the WNBA dump. Now, as of the recording of this video, which is March 24th, you guys will probably see this about a week later, but as of the recording of this video, Angel Reese is still undecided. Because of NCAA rules, Angel Reese will be forced to enter the WNBA if she wishes to continue playing basketball by 2025. Now, it is understandable why the mainstream media believes that the future for the WNBA is bright. Both Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, they are bona fide superstars at the college level. But we have seen this movie before. The WNBA has been teased in the past with the potential for a bright future. As explained earlier in the video, the WNBA, they were averaging just under 2 million viewers for regular season games in the late 90s. There was star power throughout the league, but eventually things went back to normal. Hopefully, and I mean this, hopefully, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese will be able to save the WNBA. If you are a daily viewer of this channel, you guys know how much I love the sport of basketball. I mean, just, just look at the shelf behind me. All that Pelicans gear, it's not just for decoration. I love the NBA, and believe it or not, I would be willing to watch the WNBA if they presented a watchable product. Misogyny is not the reason the WNBA has been a consistent failure. This league has been criticized for decades. It wasn't until the mainstream media decided to go woke that it became misogynist to criticize the WNBA. There is potential for the future of the WNBA to be bright. Problem is... That potential is 100% reliant on the success of one player, Caitlin Clark. All right, hope you guys enjoyed the second edition of the Rise and Fall series. I'm hoping to improve these with each iteration. I am not a documentary filmmaker. Matter of fact, I'm not even close, but hopefully I continue getting better and this format continues to improve. Now, if you have a request for the next focus of the Rise and Fall series, shoot me an email, btlkc84 at gmail.com. Right now, I'm looking into Major League Baseball, the NBA, and Skip Bayless. That should probably get us through the next two or three months. I'm trying to get these uploaded at least once a month. It takes an incredible amount of time to do the research and get these things put together. But as long as you guys enjoy them, I will continue to do it. But anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe. We are here every day, seven days a week. I will see you guys tomorrow.